lot of glib fiction has been written about life on other planets, with spaceships dropping down among alien races, zap guns decimating the enemy, while our hero goes after a beautiful princess. But Mr. Clark takes the realistic approach. Encounter in the Dawn by Arthur C. Clarke. That's next on the Lost Sci-Fi Podcast with at least one lost vintage sci-fi short story in every episode. Another five-star review on Apple Podcasts, this time from Australia. Zap Zoom FBC says, Great, this is a great podcast. The narrator is a great reader. All stories are extremely good. Thanks, Zap Zoom. And thanks to all of you who have given us a five-star review this year from all over the world. Arthur C. Clarke is back on the podcast today with a story of space travelers connecting with, well, we don't want to spoil it for you, from Amazing Stories magazine in June and July 1953. Our story can be found on page four, Encounter in the Dawn by Arthur C. Clarke. It was in the last days of the Empire. The tiny ship was far from home and almost a hundred light years from the great parent vessel, searching through the loosely packed stars at the rim of the Milky Way. But even here, it could not escape from the shadow that lay across civilization. Beneath that shadow, pausing ever and again in their work to wonder how their distant homes were faring, the scientists of the Galactic Survey still labored at their never-ending task. The ship held only three occupants, but between them they carried knowledge of many sciences and the experience of half a lifetime in space. After the long interstellar night, the star ahead was warming their spirits as they dropped down toward its fires. A little more golden, a trifle more brilliant than the sun that now seemed a legend of their childhood. They knew from past experiences that the chance of locating planets here was more than 90%, and for the moment they forgot all else in the excitement of discovery. They found the first planet within minutes of coming to rest. It was a giant of a familiar type too cold for protoplasmic life and probably possessing no stable surface. So they turned their search sunwards and presently were rewarded. It was a world that made their hearts ache for home, a world where everything was hauntingly familiar, yet never quite the same. Two great land masses floated in blue-green seas, capped by ice at either pole. There were some desert regions, but the larger part of the planet was obviously fertile. Even from this distance, the signs of vegetation were unmistakably clear. They gazed hungrily at the expanding landscape as they fell down into the atmosphere, heading towards noon in the subtropics. The ship plummeted through cloudless skies towards a great river checked its fall with a surge of soundless power and came to rest among the long grasses by the water's edge. No one moved. There was nothing to be done until the automatic instruments had finished their work. Then a bell tinkled softly and the lights on the control board flashed in a pattern of meaningful chaos. Captain Altman rose to his feet with a sigh of relief. We're in luck, he said. We can go outside without protection if the pathogenic tests are satisfactory. What did you make of the places we came in, Bertrand? Geologically stable, no active volcanoes at least. I didn't see any trace of cities, but that proves nothing. If there's a civilization here, it may have passed that stage. Or not reached it yet? Bertrand shrugged. Either's just as likely. It may take us some time to find out on a planet this size. More time than we've got, said Glendar, glancing at the communications panel that linked them to the mothership. 
and thence to the galaxy's threatened heart. For a moment there was a gloomy silence. Then Clindar walked to the control board and pressed a pattern of keys with automatic skill. With a slight jar, a section of the hull slid aside, and the fourth member of the crew stepped out onto the new planet, flexing metal limbs and adjusting servo motors to the unaccustomed gravity. Inside the ship, a television screen glimmered into life, revealing a long vista of waving grasses, some trees in the middle distance, and a glimpse of the great river. Clindar punched a button, and the picture flowed steadily across the screen as the robot turned its head. Which way shall we go? Clindar asked. Let's have a look at those trees, Altman replied. If there's any animal life, we'll find it there. Look! cried Bertrand. A bird! Clindar's fingers flew over the keyboard. The picture centered on the tiny speck that had suddenly appeared on the left of the screen and expanded rapidly as the robot's telephoto lens came into action. You're right, he said. Feathers, beak, well up the evolutionary ladder. This place looks promising. I'll start the camera. The swaying motion of the picture as the robot walked forward did not distract them. They had grown accustomed to it long ago. But they had never become reconciled to this exploration by proxy when all their impulses cried out to them to leave the ship, to run through the grass and to feel the wind blowing against their faces. Yet it was too great a risk to take, even on a world that seemed as fair as this. There was always a skull hidden behind nature's most smiling face. Wild beasts, poisonous reptiles, quagmires. Death could come to the unwary explorer in a thousand disguises. And worst of all were the invisible enemies, the bacteria and viruses, against which the only defense might often be a thousand light years away. A robot could laugh at all these dangers. And even if, as sometimes happened, it encountered a beast powerful enough to destroy it, well, machines could always be replaced. They met nothing on the walk across the grasslands. If any small animals were disturbed by the robot's passage, they kept outside its field of vision. Clindar slowed the machine as it approached the trees, and the watchers in the spaceship flinched involuntarily at the branches that appeared to slash across their eyes. The picture dimmed for a moment before the controls readjusted themselves to the weaker illumination. Then it came back to normal. The forest was full of life. It lurked in the undergrowth, clambered among the branches, flew through the air, it fled chattering and gibbering through the trees as the robot advanced. And all the while, the automatic cameras were recording the pictures that formed on the screen, gathering material for the biologist to analyze when the ship returned to base. Clindar breathed a sigh of relief when the trees suddenly thinned. It was exhausting work, keeping the robot from smashing into obstacles as it moved through the forest but on open ground it could take care of itself. Then the picture trembled as if beneath a hammer blow. There was a grinding metallic thud, and the whole scene swept vertiginously upwards as the robot toppled and fell. What's that? cried Altman. Did you trip? No, said Clindar grimly, his fingers flying over the keyboard. Something attacked from the rear. I hope, ah, I've still got control. He brought the robot to a sitting position and swiveled its head. It did not take long to find the cause of the trouble. Standing a few feet away and lashing its tail angrily was a large quadruped with a most ferocious set of teeth. At the moment it was, fairly obviously, trying to decide whether to attack again. Slowly, the robot rose to its feet, and as it did so, the great beast crouched a spring. A smile flitted across Clindar's face. He knew how to deal with the situation. 
His thumb felt for the seldom-used key labeled Siren. The forest echoed with a hideous, undulating scream from the robot's concealed speaker, and the machine advanced to meet its adversary, arms flailing in front of it. The startled beast almost fell over backwards in its efforts to turn, and in seconds was gone from sight. Now I suppose we'll have to wait a couple of hours until everything comes out of hiding again, said Bertrand ruefully. I don't know much about animal psychology, interjected Altman, but is it unusual for them to attack something completely unfamiliar? Some will attack anything that moves, but that's unusual. Normally, they only attack for food, or if they've already been threatened. What are you driving at? Do you suggest that there are other robots on this planet? Certainly not. But our carnivorous friend may have mistaken our machine for a more edible biped. Don't you think that this opening in the jungle is rather unnatural? It could easily be a path. In that case, said Glendar promptly, we'll follow it and find out. I'm tired of dodging trees, but I hope nothing jumps on us again. It's bad for my nerves. You were right, Altman, said Bertrand a little later. It's certainly a path, but that doesn't mean intelligence. After all, animals... He stopped in mid-sentence, and at the same instant, Klindar brought the advancing robot to a halt. The path had suddenly opened out into a wide clearing, almost completely occupied by a village of flimsy huts. It was ringed by a wooden palisade, obviously defense against an enemy, who at the moment presented no threat, for the gates were wide open, and beyond them the inhabitants were going peacefully about their ways. For many minutes the three explorers stared in silence at the screen. Then Klindar shivered a little and remarked, It's uncanny. It might be our own planet a hundred thousand years ago. I feel as if I've gone back in time. There's nothing weird about it, said the practical Altman. After all, we've discovered nearly a hundred planets with our type of life on them. Yes, retorted Klindar, a hundred in the whole galaxy. I still think it's strange it had to happen to us. Well, it had to happen to somebody, said Bertrand philosophically. Meanwhile, we must work out our contact procedure. If we send the robot into the village, it will start a panic. That, said Altman, is a masterly understatement. What we'll have to do is catch a native by himself and prove that we're friendly. Hide the robot, Glendar. Somewhere in the woods where it can watch the village without being spotted. We've a week's practical anthropology ahead of us. It was three days before the biological test showed that it would be safe to leave the ship. Even then, Bertrand insisted on going alone. Alone, that is, if one ignored the substantial company of the robot. With such an ally, he was not afraid of this planet's larger beasts, and his body's natural defenses could take care of the microorganisms. So, at least, the analyzers had assured him. And considering the complexity of the problem, they made remarkably few mistakes. He stayed outside for an hour, enjoying himself cautiously while his companions watched with envy. It would be another three days before they could be quite certain that it was safe to follow Bertrand's example. Meanwhile, they kept busy enough watching the village through the lenses of the robot and recording everything they could with the cameras. They had moved the spaceship at night so that it was hidden in the depths of the forest, for they did not wish to be discovered until they were ready. And all the while, the news from home grew worse. Though their remoteness here at the edge of the universe deadened its impact, it lay heavily on their minds and sometimes overwhelmed them with a sense of futility. At any moment, they knew the signal for recall might come as the Empire summoned up its last resources in its ultimate extremity. But until then, they would continue their work as though pure knowledge were the only thing that mattered.
Seven days after landing, they were ready to make the experiment. They knew now what paths the villagers use when going hunting, and Bertrand chose one of the less frequented ways. Then he placed a chair firmly in the middle of the path and settled down to read a book. It was not, of course, quite as simple as that. Bertrand had taken all imaginable precautions. Hidden in the undergrowth fifty yards away, the robot was watching through its telescopic lenses, and in its hand it held a small but deadly weapon. Controlling it from the spaceship, his fingers poised over the keyboard, Klindar waited to do what might be necessary. That was the negative side of the plan. The positive side was more obvious. Lying at Bertrand's feet was the carcass of a small horned animal, which he hoped would be an acceptable gift to any hunter passing this way. Two hours later, the radio in his suit harness whispered a warning. Quite calmly, though the blood was pounding in his veins, Bertrand laid aside his book and looked down the trail. The savage was walking forward confidently enough swinging a spear in his right hand. He paused for a moment when he saw Bertrand, then advanced more cautiously. He could tell that there was nothing to fear, for the stranger was slightly built and obviously unarmed. When only twenty feet separated them, Bertrand gave a reassuring smile and rose slowly to his feet. He bent down, picked up the carcass, and carried it forward as an offering. The gesture would have been understood by any creature on any world, and it was understood here. The savage reached forward, took the animal, and threw it effortlessly over his shoulder. For an instant, he stared into Bertrand's eyes with a fathomless expression. Then he turned and walked back towards the village. Three times he glanced round to see if Bertrand was following and each time Bertrand smiled and waved reassurance. The whole episode lasted little more than a minute. As the first contact between two races, it was completely without drama, though not without dignity. Bertrand did not move until the other had vanished from sight. Then he relaxed and spoke into his suit microphone. That was a pretty good beginning, he said jubilantly. He wasn't in the least frightened or even suspicious. I think he'll be back. It still seems too good to be true, said Altman's voice in his ear. I should have thought he'd have been either scared or hostile. Would you have accepted a lavish gift from a peculiar stranger with such little fuss? Bertrand was slowly walking back to the ship. The robot had now come out of cover and was keeping guard a few paces behind him. I wouldn't, he replied but I belong to a civilized community. Complete savages may react to strangers in many different ways, according to their past experience. Suppose this tribe has never had any enemies. That's quite possible on a large but sparsely populated planet. Then we may expect curiosity, but no fear at all. If these people have no enemies, put in Klindar, no longer fully occupied in controlling the robot, why have they got a stockade around the village? I meant no human enemies, replied Bertrand. If that's true, it simplifies our task immensely. Do you think he'll come back? Of course. If he's as human as I think, curiosity and greed will make him return. In a couple of days, we'll be bosom friends. Looked at dispassionately, it became a fantastic routine. Every morning, the robot would go hunting under Klindar's direction, until it was now the deadliest killer in the jungle. Then Bertrand would wait until Jan, which was the nearest they could get to his name, came striding confidently along the path. He came at the same time every day, and he always came alone. They wondered about this. Did he wish to keep his great discovery to himself? and thus get all the credit for his hunting prowess? If so, it showed unexpected foresight and cunning. At first, Jan had departed at once with his prize, as if afraid that the donor of such a generous gift might change his mind. 
Soon, however, as Bertrand had hoped, he could be induced to stay for a while by simply conjuring tricks and the display of brightly colored fabrics and crystals in which he took a childlike delight. At last, Bertrand was able to engage him in lengthy conversations, all of which were recorded as well as being filmed through the eyes of the hidden robot. One day, the philologist might be able to analyze this material. The best that Bertrand could do was to discover the meanings of a few simple verbs and nouns. This was made more difficult by the fact that Jan not only used different words for the same thing, but sometimes the same word for different things. Between these daily interviews, the ship traveled far, surveying the planet from the air and sometimes landing for more detailed examinations. Although several other human settlements were observed, Bertrand made no attempt to get in touch with them, for it was easy to see that they were all at much the same cultural level as Jan's people. It was, Bertrand often thought, a particularly bad joke on the part of fate that one of the galaxy's very few truly human races should have been discovered at this moment of time. Not long ago, this would have been an event of supreme importance. Now civilization was too hard-pressed to concern itself with these savage cousins waiting at the dawn of history. Not until Bertrand was sure he had become part of Jan's everyday life did he introduce him to the robot. He was showing Jan the patterns in a kaleidoscope when Klindar brought the machine striding through the grass with its latest victim dangling across one metal arm. For the first time, Jan showed something akin to fear, but he relaxed at Bertrand's soothing words, though he continued to watch the advancing monster. It halted some distance away, and Bertrand walked forward to meet it. As he did so, the robot raised its arms and handed him the dead beast. He took it solemnly and carried it back to Jan, staggering a little under the unaccustomed load. Bertrand would have given a great deal to know just what Jan was thinking as he accepted the gift. Was he trying to decide whether the robot was master or slave? Perhaps such conceptions as this were beyond his grasp. To him, the robot might be merely another man, a hunter who was a friend of Bertrand. Klindar's voice, slightly larger than life, came from the robot speaker. It's astonishing how calmly he accepts us. Won't anything scare him? You will keep judging him by your own standards, replied Bertrand. Remember, his psychology is completely different and much simpler. Now that he has confidence in me, anything that I accept won't worry him. I wonder if that will be true of all his race, queried Altman. It's hardly safe to judge by a single specimen. I want to see what happens when we send the robot into the village. Hello, exclaimed Bertrand. That surprised him. He's never met a person who could speak with two voices before. Do you think he'll guess the truth when he meets us? said Klindar. No, the robot will be pure magic to him, but it won't be any more wonderful than fire and lightning and all the other forces he must already take for granted. Well, what's the next move? asked Altman, a little impatiently. Are you going to bring him to the ship, or will you go into the village first? Bertrand hesitated. I'm anxious not to do too much too quickly. You know the accidents that have happened with strange races when that's been tried. I'll let him think this over, and when we get back tomorrow, I'll try and persuade him to take the robot back to the village. In the hidden ship, Klindar reactivated the robot and started it moving again. Like Altman, he was growing a little impatient of this excessive caution. But on all matters relating to alien life forms, Bertrand was the expert, and they had to obey his orders. There were times now when he almost wished he were a robot himself, devoid of feelings or emotions, able to watch the fall of a leaf or the death agonies of a world with equal detachment. The sun was low when Jan heard the great voice crying from the jungle. He recognized it at once. 
Despite its inhuman volume, it was the voice of his friend, and it was calling him. In the echoing silence, the life of the village came to a stop. Even the children ceased their play. The only sound was the thin cry of a baby, frightened by the sudden silence. All eyes were upon Jan as he walked swiftly to his hut and grasped the spear that lay beside the entrance. The stockade would soon be closed against the prowlers of the night, but he did not hesitate as he stepped out into the lengthening shadows. He was passing through the gates when once again that mighty voice summoned him, and now it held a note of urgency that came clearly across all the barriers of language and culture. The shining giant who spoke with many voices met him a little way from the village and beckoned him to follow. There was no sign of Bertrand. They walked for almost a mile before they saw him in the distance, standing not far from the river's edge and staring out across the dark, slowly moving waters. He turned as Jan approached, yet for a moment seemed unaware of his presence. Then he gave a gesture of dismissal to the Shining One, who withdrew into the distance. Jan waited. He was patient, and though he could never have expressed it in words, contented. When he was with Bertrand, he felt the first intimations of that selfless, utterly irrational devotion his race would not fully achieve for many ages. It was a strange tableau. Here at the river's brink, two men were standing. One was dressed in a closely fitting uniform, equipped with tiny, intricate mechanisms. The other was wearing the skin of an animal and was carrying a flint-tipped spear. Ten thousand generations lay between them. Ten thousand generations and an immeasurable gulf of space. Yet they were both human. As she must do often in eternity, nature had repeated one of her basic patterns. Presently, Bertrand began to speak, walking to and fro in short, quick steps as he did, and in his voice there was a trace of madness. It's all over, Jan. I'd hoped that with our knowledge we could have brought you out of barbarism in a dozen generations. But now you'll have to fight your way up from the jungle alone, and it may take you a million years to do so. I'm sorry. There's so much we could have done. Even now, I wanted to stay here, but Altman and Klindar talk of duty, and I suppose that they are right. There is little enough that we can do, but our world is calling, and we must not forsake it. I wish you could understand me, Jan. I wish you knew what I was saying. I'm leaving you these tools, some of them you'll discover how to use, though as likely as not, in a generation they'll be lost or forgotten. See how this blade cuts? It'll be ages before your world can make its like. And guard this well. When you press the button, look. If you use it sparingly, it'll give you light for years, though sooner or later it will die. As for these other things, find what use for them you can. Here come the first stars, up there in the east. Do you ever look at the stars, Jan? I wonder how long it'll be before you've discovered what they are, and I wonder what will have happened to us by then. Those stars are our home, John, and we cannot save them. Many have died already, an explosion so vast that I can imagine them no more than you. In a hundred thousand of your years, the light of those funeral pyres will reach your world and see its peoples wondering. By then, perhaps your race will be reaching for the stars. I wish I could warn you against the mistakes we made, and which now will cost us all that we have won. It is well for your people, Jan, that your world is here, at the frontier of the universe. You may escape the doom that waits for us. One day, perhaps, your ships will go searching among the stars as we have done and they may come upon the ruins of our worlds and wonder who we were. But they will never know that we met here by this river when your race was young. Here come my friends. They could give me no more time. Goodbye, Jan. Use well the things I've left you. They are your world's greatest treasures.
Something huge, something that glittered in the starlight, was sliding down from the sky. It did not reach the ground, but came to rest a little way above the surface, and in utter silence, a rectangle of light opened in its side. The shining giant appeared out of the night and stepped through the golden door. Bertrand followed, pausing for a moment at the threshold to wave back at Jan. Then the darkness closed behind him. No more swiftly than smoke drifts upwards from a fire, the ship lifted away. When it was so small that Jan felt he could hold it in his hands, it seemed to blur into a long line of light slanting upwards into the stars. From the empty sky, a peal of thunder echoed over the sleeping land, and Jan knew at last that the gods were gone and would never come again. For a long time, he stood by the gently moving waters, and into his soul there came a sense of loss he was never to forget and never to understand. Then, carefully and reverently, he collected together the gifts that Bertrand had left. Under the stars, the lonely figure walked homeward across a nameless land. Behind him, the river flowed softly to the sea, winding through the fertile plains on which, more than a thousand centuries ahead, Jan's descendants would build the great city they were to call Babylon. Next on the Lost Sci-Fi Podcast, John Thurman swore he'd be the first man on the moon, but he wasn't. He was only the first murderer. The First Man on the Moon by Alfred Koppel. <laughs>